go. Welcome to the Split Sheet Masterclass. My name is Dave Bogan. I'm the head of third party partnerships at Mechanical Licensing Collective. I'm uh, Jesse, a uh, music attorney at uh, Music Law Pro or Morris Music Law, as you got up there. Yes. So uh, I'm just going to dive right into it because we only have a little bit of time and uh, we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to talk about some background to help all of you um, to get to understand where we're talking, you know, where we're going with the split sheets. So every day, thousands of music creators make the decision to collaborate, to write, record, and release new music. And some of you may already be collaborating with your friends, whether you're in a band, uh, whether you're in a small group, or whether you're collaborating with other musicians online. If your music is good enough, that music can create, uh, uh, can generate uh, income from live performances and venues, from streams on Spotify and Apple Music and other digital services, from views on YouTube and Twitch, from placement and, mu and movies and TV shows, and many other income sources. Generally speaking, when you collaborate um, on lyrics and melody to make up a song, you become a copyright owner with the power to control how the song is used. So this is everyone who collaborates on that. So if you write lyrics, if you help compose a song, uh, the music, uh, you become a collaborator that's known as a copyright owner. Each writer or copyright owner owns a percentage of the song out of a total pie of 100%. And you must be paid according to your ownership percentage. So if there's multiple writers, there's splits. So let me give you an example. Three music creators collaborated on the song Move the Crowd as follows. Vanessa wrote lyrics, Stephanie wrote lyrics, and Kevin composed the music, which embodies the melody. So again, uh, the lyrics and the melody makes up a song, and all collaborators on a song are copyright owners. So here we have three, Vanessa, Stephanie, and Kevin. Now, how much of the song should each writer own, and what should the percentage what should the ownership percentages be? Vanessa thinks the song ownership should be split into thirds with each writer owning one third or 33.33% out of 100. Stephanie calculates the math and agrees that the splits need to be fair, but one third does not add up to 100%. It adds up to 99.99%. Kevin does not agree with the one third ownership split at all and does not want 33 and 33% ownership, 33.33% ownership. Kevin feels that a song is 50% lyrics and 50% music. Therefore, since Vanessa and Stephanie worked on the lyrics, they should divide the lyrics share amongst themselves to get 25% each. And since Kevin composed all of the music, he should be entitled to the full 50% ownership of the music. So again, all collaborators, of a piece of, uh, of a song on the lyrics and the melody become owners um, known as copyright owners. Uh, so songwriters or writers are copyright owners. And that song must be split between the collaborators. But as we can see here, all the collaborators are not in agreement on what that split should be. So who is correct? They have to have 100% song ownership, but they have not determined what that split should look like. And pass it over to Jesse. All right. Thanks again for joining us. Um, yeah, super quick. This is not uh, legal advice here. It's a guy. Guy, say my little disclaimer. Um, <laughs> so, so just in in general, without the split sheet, without something in writing signed by Vanessa, Stephanie, and Kevin, they all equally own it. So thirds. Um, that's just that's just the way default law works in America. Um, and also they would all equally own the music and lyrics if they had their intent to, to create a song together. Now Kevin is a co-owner of the lyrics and Stephanie and Vanessa are co-owners of the music, unless they had an intent to like write a poem that's separate from the music, which is not the case here. Um, so Kevin definitely wants a split sheet so that he can get more than a third um in, in this context but he's gonna have to get vanessa and stephanie to agree um two different splits otherwise they're gonna be equal owners of the song um and i think it's really helpful to kind of understand 
the industry custom and context as well. Um, we got kind of high level law here. There's a song, there's, there's writers, authors of the song, their, their total adds up to hundred um, percent. But then, then what do we do here? What's right? Um, it really depends on the industry on the genre. Um, so in Nashville and country, country music, it's really a lot of times equal splits. That, that's the custom there in hip hop. It's oftentimes the music is 50% lyrics or 50% kind of or like whoever did the beat, the music is 50 and then the top line rappers are the other 50. Um, and, and just varies on genre and, and customs, but ultimately whoever wrote the song comes together. And even if they are equal, it's still a good idea to memorialize that so that everybody has on paper what their splits are. And then we can register their shares in the song to get your money. Um, for example, from the MLC for, for mechanicals. Um, so it's really, really important to, to memorialize what each writer's share of the song is and then capture the, the necessary data so that everybody can register those splits in the song and then get paid. So um, here's, a, here's a very, very basic um, sample split sheets so you can really see how this works in practice. Um, I'm a visual guy, so I like to see things. So we could start off with the date. Uh, let's put in the date day. Day is doing a really helping me out here by a, filling this out for me. So, and then we got the title of the song. I think it's Move the Crowd Day. Or, um, yeah, I was about to come up with a new name, but I forgot. <laughs> I'm for, we're good. And then we can go to the next page here. And let me just explain these real quick before we fill in. So this first page, and, and hopefully everybody gets a copy of this for free uh, by joining this panel. Um, so this first page is just very basic information to capture um, who the authors are and get to our 100% and some other basic stuff. And then th there's a second page that has a bit more information. Um, that's, that's helpful to register. And then the last page is to kind of capture contact info. Um, and, and a lot of this is organized is to keep it simple, keep it on a page instead of a bunch of spreadsheets and, and all complicated and just make it easy for everybody. Yeah, so as, as I'm talking, Day's filling in. So we got Vanessa, nice last name's Day. So mm -hmm. here, here um, yeah, why don't we go with Kevin? Kevin wins the argument and he's like, you know, this is uh, it's like hip hop. Um, you know, I really, I'm getting my 50 and, and Vanessa and Stephanie, they, they were like, okay, okay, we get it. It's not a country song. Um, you know, we, we understand it. it's kind of like in this genre, we'll agree on these splits. Um, so, so here we are. Um, we can get the song title up in there too, day in, in one. It's supposed to autofill, but not happening here. Um, let's, let's move on. We could, we obviously, that's an easy one to fill out. It'd be the same titles on the first page. And then we can just put in the same writers here again, day and three, just their last names. Yeah. Um, so the reason why this isn't a separate section is so that we can just be very clear who wrote this song, what do they do, and what are their percentages in, the, in that other section. And then here, the publisher takes it to another level if you don't have any publishing agreement, you're just self-published. You are your own publisher. However, if, you, if you've signed an agreement with a third-party publisher um, or you have your own publishing set up, then we want to list that because that publisher is going to have certain rights and obligations that other, the other writers are going to know about. So, Jesse, um, what, is, what is a sample? And give me some examples of samples. Great. So, we, a sample, you know, copying somebody else's song. So, you know, I'm going to sing a Taylor Swift song and I'm going to take her first, her melody and write new lyrics. Like, that's not original. I'm using a Taylor Swift melody. Or I'm going to take a, 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 a recording bit from another song, a little guitar loop, and then I'm going to loop that in my song. I'm using a pre-existing recording and potentially the melody from that guitar loop. So if we have any, if the song's not original, we need to know because that implicates other rights. Um, of Taylor Swift or the guitar player. Um, and what would happen if I create a pop song and I'm using a piece of Taylor Swift song? What would happen to the splits ownership? Yeah, so we need to go to Taylor Swift and her publisher 
and let's, let's see just... if we can get approval. And if we can, then we negotiate how that works. And this there would be a contract. Yeah, and then Taylor would get in as a writer. And we see that in the news of um, <laughs> pretty recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she could, but yeah, she's going to negotiate and take some of the pie, right? So yeah, and, and sometimes you use a little bit, and they take the whole thing, or they say no, you can't use it. So it's it's a negotiation. If you straight up cover, then it's not your song anymore. You're just covering, and that's a different situation. Right. This is you're creating this in your song here. So there's a difference if Stephanie, Vanessa, and Kevin just decided to do their own version, uh, their own cover of a Taylor Swift song, as opposed to using a Taylor Swift uh, recording uh, in their in their music. Yeah, total difference. Because yeah. using a piece of a recording, then you're creating something new. It's a derivative work. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just cover it, it's a it's still the original writer's song and you're you're covering it and there's different mechanisms. There's a compulsory license to release that. So then this next question here, just charging through, I want to leave a lot of time for QA for mm -hmm. sessions like this. Um, so then the, the other kind of high level question we capture on this first page is just, um, are, are the, all the writers going to administer their own shares or are they going to grant the right to administer or control the song to, um, somebody else, either one of the writers or an artist or a publisher, um, typically each writer and their publishing designee controls their own share. However, especially when you're starting out or independent musicians, or if you write with somebody who doesn't know what's going on, you can get control or administration rights from another writer so that one party can control it. Or a band decides to set up their own publishing designee for the entire band and all of their members. So each band member assigns rights to control to that one band publishing company. Right. So it's so a so if we have a uh, uh, a high school band in the audience, I'd say it's five members of the band and they all write on the song um, and different uh, contributions. So they all may own um, an equal 20%, right, of all five, but they might decide one of them is the more responsible of the five. So they wanna just let that guy um, handle the administration. Yeah, so then they would, they would do a separate agreement where mm -hmm all the band members grant the right to administer the song to the responsible guy. Right. And, all right. So, um, and then, like, and then go down and most importantly, you get everybody to sign this thing in right. section six. So we have an email there just cause we do a lot of e-signing and that's how you trigger to e-sign. And then here you have a basic document where the writers agree on the song title, very basic information and they sign off. Right. And now we've now now Kevin is like, all right, I got my 50%. I'm not a third on this song. Yeah. I got my 50. So then Kevin uh and, and and so they will go ahead and save this. They'll all sign it. They'll all have a copy of this. And now they are in agreement that we uh are uh you know, this is our splits on this piece of music on this on this song. Great. Yeah, so great. Yeah, and then the, the next page is a bit more information. Um, it's kind of like IPI number. You want to go to the next page, Day? Here we go. So it'd be the same type. And then here we can get the writers and we can get, uh, they would be a Meyer ASCAP. We can get their IPI number. Um, that's really helpful to register correctly in case. What is, what is BMI and ASCAP and what is an IPI number? Great. So BMI and ASCAP are performance rights organizations, hence the PRO right there. They uh, collect performance royalties for musical compositions. Um, they're based out of the United States. Different countries have different PROs. Um, ASCAP and BMI are, are free to join um, and open to anyone, basically. And CSAC is invite only. There's also GMR, but that's invite only as well. Um, so these organizations, these performing rights organizations, um, what do they do for these songwriters? Yeah, they, so they license and collect the performance rights. So if a song, if this song, Move the Crowd, is performed on radio, BMI and ASCAP will collect a payment from the radio station and then pay um, half the money to the writers and half the money to the publishers. Um, and what is an IPI? IPI is kind of like your social security number for the, the writing publishing universe. It's a unique number that attaches to 
uh, a unique name. So if Vanessa has a, has a stage name, um, Vanessa Cool, it would have a different IPI number, even though that's still her. And that just like a social security number helps, um, you know, other people know that it's you because that's a unique number. The IPI number helps the PROs, other writers, other other people in the music universe to know that that is you as a writer to ensure that you're getting paid and accounted to and accredited correctly. Great. And this is more advanced stuff. We don't, we're not going to die. Yeah, so the publisher has, the, has an IPI too. So all the publishers, and then that's a bit more advanced. If there was a sample, then we want to know what it is. And then usually it's not just the song. There's also a recording of the song that goes out to the Spotify's and Amazon's and Apple's. So by connecting the song to the recording, we're able to much better match that that song is being performed or exploited to be able to pay the writers. So capturing the information from the recording is helpful to do registrations and keep track of the song. And then this last one, the song registrations is, um, as the registry can fill out to ensure that you know everything is being registered. And again, this is the United States, other countries are different, um, but you, we see you know the MLC, um, Copyright Office, Harry Fox, Music Reports, these are different organizations um, that come into the publishing universe to collect and distribute royalties to songwriters and publishers, um, depending upon their role. And then it's always helpful to know, have contact info and know who your other writers and other parties are. So to, to keep everything kind of streamlined, we have the last page of just keeping track of people's emails and phones because things come up. Say a movie wants to use uh, Move the Crowd and everybody co-admins and, and Kevin is the one who knows the movie people. He's got to get in touch with Vanessa and Stephanie to get their permission and help help them facilitate licensing on their end. So here's our, oh, here's our splits. Oh, what's their email? So it's just right here, easy to access um, so that everyone can come together and work together um, for the best chance for this song. Right. So all writers must agree to the ownership percentages. And we do that in this document, which makes sure, which is ensures that we all have the same information and that we've all agreed on it and that we store it. So this is an important part of the being in the business. You know, there's one thing of just working together and collaborating and making a song. And this is the difference between being, um, you know, doing uh, music as a hobby and doing music in the business, right? Correct. Yeah, if music's a hobby, who cares? Just make music and it's a hobby. Right. You're having fun and nothing to take away from that. Right. Um, but if you're in the business, there's paperwork and you have to do things professionally. And this is pretty much like your first step in the in the business side is making sure this document gets put together right after you write the song, right? Ideally, yes. There's a, you know, oftentimes it happens on emails or texts or all over the place or it's a scramble and there's someone comes in to co-write and then we don't like them. And then, so ideally it happens like, you're going to write with someone, all right, we all agree we're going to be equal split. So I'm working with a producer. You're not having publishing or you're going to have 50% for this beat. But then other times that messes up the creative vibe and you got to write the song and you don't want to be arguing about splits until it's all done. And then before you release, um, you, you definitely want to work this out so that everybody knows where they stand and everybody can be registered and paid correctly. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. And this is from... Jesse from Moore's Music Law. And, and, uh, and also, uh, yeah, Music Law Pro is a companion service. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we offer... Oh, sorry. You got a little delay there. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Music Law Pro is just a, a law firm that has uh, fixed rates and subscription offerings as opposed to, um, you know, a typical hourly type of arrangement. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so now we've learned, let me go back a little bit, that Stephanie, Vanessa, and Kevin have to figure out what their ownership is gonna be, and it has to equal 100%. And that can look a little different. You mentioned a little bit something earlier, I want you to cover it again in another 60 seconds. You mentioned um, different genres. Uh, different yeah. genres have different splits? Absolutely, there's customs. The, the law is that everybody who writes equally shares unless there's a written contract to the contrary. 
Um, so in this case, Kevin wanted the contract, the split sheet, to get more than a third. So um, what in, Vanessa said would have been similar to what the law defaults to. Correct. That would that'd be the default. Without them writing and agreeing upon it, if they're all joint authors, they're joint owners equally. And also, piggyback to that, we will get to the genre point. But a, another important thing here that goes to kind of the admin or control rights is that as a co-owner without an agreement saying to the contrary, everybody's allowed to exploit or use the whole copyright without the other co-owner's permission. Right. Um, you just have to account to them. That's not good practice, but you're allowed to. And, and oftentimes writers don't want that ability. It's a very personal thing, these songs. So you don't want it out on a, on a commercial or a, a movie that you don't like necessarily. So it's important to, to memorialize that if possible. Genre. So country's easy. If you're, you know, if you're in the room, you equally share. Even if I write one word or I barely even write anything, I'm in the room. I get the same amount as every, every other writer on that song. That's kind of Nashville splits. Very, very, very customary. Uh, hip hop, very customary for producer of the beat or the music to get 50%. And then the, the artists, whether they're featured or just the primary or um, any top line, share the other 50%. The lyrics, the, the people who wrote the lyrics. Yes. Yeah, the lyrics would get 50 and then the music. But but the lyrics are also going to be melodic oftentimes. So it's not just music lyrics. It's like the beat versus the top line in hip hop. In pop, um, it can really vary. Um, sometimes like artists even get a split if they didn't write anything because they have to go out and Hustle the song. I don't necessarily like that, but um, you know, the, the, the ranges on, on who you. I've, I've had cases where someone did a, a snare sound and got ten percent of the song, or you bring somebody mm -hmm. in. Just um, it just really varies depending upon the context and, and who's working on it. Uh, rock generally is like the band will either be kind of like the, the the Beatles and be like, you know, f you, Ringo, you didn't write the song. Paul, Paul and John did. You don't get nothing, Ringo. Or like the Stones or like Coldplay. Like everybody, you're in the band. You get, you get, you share with us equally. And you know, a band and rock will kind of work that out. Either high level, kind of like case by case, or just we're in the band. You share um, equally with the rest of the band. Um, and then it gets, you know, depending upon the genre, there's there's different customs, and it's important to kind of understand that because. You could be working with professional writers. You could, they have a history behind these things. Um, but in the end of the day, it is negotiable. It, it, other than just the default equal splits, you know, it's always negotiable what um, all the writers' uh, percentages add up to to get to that 100%. Right. And um, it just depends upon, you know, each song with, with the, that kind of genre context and history behind it. All right. So to, sum so to summarize... Um what you've gone over, all writers must agree to the ownership percentages, also called splits, um, then sign the split sheet to acknowledge and validate its accuracy. Then the information on the split sheet can be used to register song information to music rights organizations that are responsible for paying music royalties to each writer based on their song ownership percentages. So now I'm gonna talk about songwriter royalties. And I work at the MLC or the Mechanical Licensing Collective. We are one of the music rights organizations in the United States. We pay out royalties to songwriters um, of uh, who have songs on all your favorite services, um, but they too must know and have an agreement on what those ownership percentages are. Otherwise, we cannot pay them out. So what are songwriter royalties? Songwriter royalties are royalties that are earned when a song is copied or reproduced distributed in phono records or sound recordings, for example, uh, publicly performed or used as the basis of creating a new work, which we call derivative works. So we have a quick little uh, animated video I'm gonna play here about the MLC and about song royalties. You're a music creator and wanna start making money off your music. So, you sign up for a music distribution service that uploads your songs to the top platforms. Now, your songs are streamed by thousands of listeners every month across the United States.
but you might not know that with every stream, you earn separate royalties as an artist and a songwriter. Although you get paid artist royalties by your distributor, many distributors do not collect and pay songwriter royalties. Your songwriter royalties are paid to music rights organizations. Performance royalties are paid to performing rights organizations and digital mechanical royalties are paid to the Mechanical Licensing Collective, or the MLC. If you want to collect all of your mechanical streaming money from your song, you should join the MLC. It's free to join and pays out 100% of the mechanical royalties that it collects on your behalf. And you will receive royalty payments monthly. So what are you waiting for? Join the MLC today and get paid. All right. So the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, is a uh, U.S. music rights organization, a nonprofit. Um, we administer um, the blanket audio mechanical license, basically. Eres un creador de música oh. y quieres empezar a ganar dinero con tu música. And we have it in Spanish too. <laughs> um, so, so it's it's a it's a law in the United States that if you are a songwriter um, and you own your copyrights. Um, you must get paid these mechanical royalties when your songs are um, streamed on uh, interactive services such as Spotify or Apple Music or Pandora. Um, and the MLC is the organization that collects and pays out those royalties. So we're going to open it up for Q&A now, um, take some questions. I believe we have, um, I think we have 15 minutes. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up for Q&A. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for this discussion. I've seen some questions come in um, from the audience, so I'm just going to get started with those. This first question is coming in from Mateo Raider from LA. Um, they asked, I learned here that even splits are default without a signed split sheet. Is that just theoretical or do some songs, indie or major release without a written deal? I'll jump in there. Um, I mean, it's, it's default law, so under copyright law, without the signed you know, contract, everybody is an equal share in that song. And ideally, you know, the, the splits are agreed upon before a song comes out, but it does happen um, actually quite regularly that just songs come out and nobody even knows about this. Um, and maybe not even credited any songwriters correctly, let alone have the splits, let alone actually getting the songwriters paid so just because something happens doesn't mean it's the right thing to happen. It's not the professional thing to happen, um, but it does happen um, in the music industry. Awesome. Um, I'll move on to the next question then. Um, Jack Burke asked, what's the average amount of points a producer would get on the recording royalties? I'll jump in here again, Day. So um, this gets confused a lot. So um, in one of the, in that video, there's kind of like the artist and the songwriter. So when we talk about producer points or producer royalty, that's on the, the recording side, the artist side. Um, the producer would get separate uh, publishing side, songwriting side, if they actually wrote on the song. Um, so they, there are customs for producer points um, from the master side in exchange for the producer not owning any of the master. And uh, a producer typically gets um, three royalty points when they're starting out, and then four if you get some more cuts, five, six if you're bigger. Um, and that comes out of the artist share. And that's a whole nother panel about how producer royalties and producer contracts and agreements work. Um, but it's important to note that a, that a producer oftentimes is contributing both to the songwriting and to the, to the master. Um, and, and if they are on the songwriting, you know, then the split sheet conversation comes into play and, and they're participating on the songwriting side and get money from the MLC and the pros, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's a, it's a great question and it comes up all the time. So it's not. Awesome. Thank you. Day, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, yes. Um, so we didn't get to dive into it on this particular uh, masterclass, but it is important um, to understand that um, today we talked about a, a song, um, which is also called a musical work, um, and that is really the lyrics and the melody. Um, but when that song is recorded 
and there's a final version, which we sometimes call a master um, or a sound recording or recording, that's a separate copyright. And we don't necessarily deal with splits as much as we do with um, royalties associated with the those who uh, worked on the uh, um, on the uh, the master. So a master might be owned by a label. Many of you who are artists may be interested in getting a, a record label deal in the future. Um, and then that deal, uh, you would be um, receiving some royalties on the, um, the sound recording. Uh, and from your royalties, you generally pay uh, the producer out, uh, which is where producer points come from. Um, so it's, it gets a little bit more layered and complicated um, when we talk about um, um, deals. Uh, but it is important to understand that when you contribute to music, whether you're writing lyrics or um, coming up with a melody or composing a music or um, you're the you know, feature performer in the studio, um, there's some type of um, entitlement. Um, and that may be a ownership in the copyright like we went over today, um, or it may be income participation, which is what a producer points are on the master side is, is, is they don't own the copyright but uh, of the sound recording, but they do participate um, in the income. Uh, based on what's negotiated. But, but but as Jesse mentioned, there are some sort of industry customs, um, which more um, those customs align with whether it's independent or major, and then also the, the career level of the producer. You know, if you're a Grammy Award winning producer, you're not going to get the same points as someone who's just starting out and only has, you know, one or two songs on the radio, um, or no songs at all on the radio. Um, you know, now we, we, you know, we look at streaming numbers. Um, so, it's you should conceptually understand that there are different types of splits and ownership associated and income participation associated with music that goes beyond just the creative part of you coming up with uh, you know a hook or coming up with a verse or thinking about um, you know a, a drum part or something. Awesome, thank you. All right, I'll move on to the next question, which was sent in by Daniel Serville, who asked, what is the policy for artists, publishers, or songwriters not coming to an agreement of a split? Yeah, so we discussed that it was, uh, by default, that everybody contributing to the song would be an equal owner, have equal splits of that song. Um, so if someone's going to release it the first time, it's good practice to get all the writers to say, okay, uh, that we're okay with this version, put it out. At least we haven't agreed on splits and we're okay with equal. Because once a song's out, then anybody can cover it um, and it's out in the world. Um, but that's just, it's very, very simple. It's if you don't agree to the contrary, then everybody equally owns um, both the music and the lyrics it's a joint work, even if you just did one or the other, um, unless the intent is to not have it, not have that all be like one song together. And let me take that a step further. Let's say, for example, as we saw, yeah, we had three contributors, Stephanie, Vanessa, and Kevin. And uh, Vanessa felt that the song should be split three ways. Kevin, uh, well, a, a third, and Kevin felt that he should get half and that Vanessa and uh, Stephanie each should get a quarter. Um, now, let's say that they did not come to an agreement and sign a split sheet that demonstrates that they all agree on the splits, but each of them went back to their PRO um, and registered the song. Uh, PRO is a performing rights organization that represents uh, songwriters and publishers um, in the sense that the PRO will license their music to Spotify, for example, or Apple Music, and then Spotify will pay the PRO, and then the PRO would then pay the songwriters based on those splits. So let's say that Vanessa went to her PRO, BMI, and registered it all as a third, and then um, um, Stephanie went to her PRO, and let's say her PRO is CSEC, for example, because BMI asset has a relationship now um, in terms of data, but, um, and registered, uh, you know, it, it, or Kevin went to CSAC and registered as a half. And so what could happen is there could be some discrepancy on those splits. And even though the music might get released into the world and start to generate royalties, when those royalties 
trickle down to the uh, or make it back to the um, music rights organization, um, they cannot pay out uh, on, on those songs because there's a disagreement uh, or what we call a dis dispute. Um, so what happens is those royalties get held and no one gets paid until they can resolve it. Um, it's not the organization's responsibility to resolve those ownership shares. Um, it is the parties, the, the, the copyright owners, uh, responsibility. So I work at Mechanical Licensing Collective, and every month we pay out royalties to songwriters, like I said in that video. Uh, but there are some scenarios where we get the royalties and we can't pay them out because there's discrepancy, right, for example. Um, so it's important that you know, ideally, the ideal situation is that before you release the music, um, all the songwriters come to an agreement on the splits. Um, depending on the genre, that happens less frequently in some genres um, because there's still sometimes it moves so fast between rec coming up with an idea, recording it and just getting it out the door and no one sat down to follow about the business side. Um, so it is important to always have someone thinking about um, if we're putting this out into the world, we anticipated earning royalties. So we should probably agree on how we're going to split this, these royalties in advance. And then someone wants to license it like the TV show. And it's like, can't do it if we can't agree on what our shares are. And then you lose that opportunity. The right. TV show, the film, it's just. If you want the best chance for this song, you're going to write with other people. you got to agree with each other. Um, Good example. Basic minimum of like what your shares of the song are. So let's say, for example, um, you know, there's a movie and um, they really like the song, um, a movie the crowd, and they want to go and put it in the movie. Uh, well, the pr production company must have permission from all 100% copyright owners. So let's say they go to Stephanie and Stephanie says, sure, you can put it in a movie. I own a third. And um, they go to Vanessa and say, sure, I would love to have my, my song in a movie. I own a third. And then they go to Kevin and say, sure, we'd love to have a movie. I own half. So now <laughs> they have too much percentage, right? It's, it's over claiming. Um, or if they don't have, if they can't reach Kevin, they don't know how much he has. There's no agreement on it. And they don't have full uh, coverage in terms of licensing to be able to put it in a movie. So they all miss out on the movie opportunity because there is no agreement on the splits. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got one last question from Mason Whittingham. What happens if you pay somebody up front for something like guitar session? Are they still entitled to a percentage? Well, it's a little bit different. So when you hire a musician, we call them session musicians to play on your recording. Now, generally, when you hire someone for a guitar session, um, you may already have that uh, composed, right? They're playing what you're giving them uh, or they're performing on their guitar, what you're giving them. So they, they, they get paid for their time, for their for their skill as a, as a, as a guitarist um, during that session. So they get paid as a session musician. Um, if they're not contributing to the melody, if they're not adding to the lyrics, or if they're not adding to the song in any way other than performing the uh, you know the, the guitar part, um, they're not technical. They're not a writer. Uh, they're not considered an author or a writer, and therefore they're not considered a copyright owner um, in the song, and therefore has no um, entitlement to a percentage of the song. Now it's different if you say, "Hey, I have some." Um, I have lyrics and a guitar idea, but you bring someone on and they fully come up with the melody, you know, with their guitar. Um, then now they're helping to write the song. Um, they're contributing to the song um, in a way that would make them entitled to a split. So it really, it really depends on what the role is of the guitarist. Is 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 he or she simply? Um, playing a part that's already been written for the guitar, or are they helping to come up with the guitar part using their own um, creative input? That will differentiate between them being a copyright owner and them just being a session musician. And and to take that a step further, memorializing that agreement with the guitar player. Here's what you're getting paid, and here's you don't own anything here. You didn't write anything, or 
Yeah, it's a work for hire on the master, but you did write something and here's your share of the song and how those rights go. Because if you don't have it written down, then the guitar player is like, well, I wrote the lyrics. And then the artist is like, no, you didn't. I did it. And then that's not what you want happening. You know, you want everybody getting along so that it can get out there and get everybody paid and, and have the best chance for success. Makes sense. All right. Let's all thank our panel today with a round of applause in the chat. Um, throw some exclamation points in there if you can. And thanks for joining us. Um, and big thanks to Day and Jesse for talking with us today. Uh, one last thing. Um, if you are over the age of 13 and you actually have already written songs and put songs up on Spotify or Apple Music via a distributor, you can contact the MLC and learn more about the MLC by um, you know, going to MLC.com and seeing uh, what it what you need to join. It is free to join and it's open to uh, songwriters over the age of 13. I'm alone, so gone.